Welcome, everyone. Um, happy 20th of April. I hope that everyone's having a magical day. Uh, today, tonight, rather, we're going to go through a small little presentation on object-oriented programming design patterns. Uh, and we'll get into what design patterns are in just a moment. Here's our introduction. Um, we're going to introduce the idea of object-oriented design patterns. We're going to discuss various benefits to applying these patterns. We're going to delve into specific design patterns and discuss their use cases, and then explore code examples of code with and without various design patterns. So here's just like a brief 30 second pitch. Why should anybody care? Um, we can reduce the time we spend engineering. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, these are generally tried and true. So when they're applied correctly, they do what you apply them to do. Um, because these are familiar and well tested, less time is spent maintaining them. And um, they're generally maintainable. And the authors of the book that we're about to talk about really had the idea of the software development life cycle in mind when they wrote it. Um, and there's a caveat to this you must make sure you're using them correctly, otherwise, you can waste a ton of resources when you don't need to. So, brace yourselves. Here's a boring history lesson. Um, so the term design patterns gained a lot of popularity with the 1994 publication of Design Patterns, uh, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Programming. Uh, the authors are typically known as the Gang of Four, and they will be referenced as such, sometimes as G-O-F, throughout the remainder of this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other books on this subject and many criticisms to the book. And I think perhaps even more important than the book were the conversations that the publication of the book really brought upon. Because some people have protested this idea and thinks that the idea of employing a design pattern is kind of like an architectural anti-pattern anti in itself because code should be tailored so specifically to each area of the application. Um, there's a ton of literature and debates available about that. So, who cares? These people. Um, these are just some reviews. You can actually find these within the book if you ever uh, buy it, read it, find it. Um, this is one of the best written, wonderfully insightful books that I've read in a great long while. This book establishes the legitimacy of patterns in the best way, not by argument, but by example. Um, so I really do recommend checking out this book. Uh, it's very neat. It's actually written uh, towards C++. And these design patterns, while we're going to talk about them in Java today, they're present all over the place in various languages uh, that employ object-oriented programming paradigms. Uh, so this is useful for C++. It's useful for C Sharp. Uh, it's good stuff. This book is, um, uh, I'm not going to read more of the reviews, but I have more of them on this next page. I'm going to leave them on the screen for a minute so you can see what other developers have said about the book because I've introduced the book and I got to make sure that there's at least some recognition that the book might matter. Finally, this is the last of the reviews in the book. So, now that that's over, we can take a deep breath. And uh, this is a quote from the very beginning of the book. Designing object-oriented software is hard, and designing reusable object-oriented software is even harder. And the Gang of Four leads in with this line in the book to... Um, kind of introduce the idea that they're going to help you design this reusable software in a way that you may have not previously thought to do. So they discuss three particular types of design patterns throughout the book, and we will discuss them tonight, although we'll hone in mostly on creational and structural patterns. Um, they are creational, structural, and behavioral. So we'll now take a couple minutes to introduce each of these before diving into some examples. Um, a creational pattern is, uh, I took this right from the book, creational design patterns abstract the instantiation process. They help make a system independent of how its objects are created, composed, and represented. A class creational pattern uses inheritance to vary the classes that's instantiated, whereas an object creational pattern will delegate instantiation to another object. Uh, so when you think of creational patterns, think of 
alternatives to a simple constructor system. We're going to instantiate things differently and employ a bit more object-oriented design to that process in hopes that we can make our code better. Structural patterns. Again, right out of the book. Rather than composing interfaces or implementations, structural object patterns describe ways to compose objects to realize new functionality. The added flexibility of object composition comes from the ability to change the composition at runtime, which is impossible with static class composition. Um, so these structural patterns, not so much focused on instantiating objects, rather changing the way that they behave and perhaps interact with other objects. And then behavioral patterns are concerned with algorithms and the assignment of responsibilities between objects. Behavioral patterns describe not just patterns of objects or classes, but also the patterns of communication between them. These patterns characterize complex control flow that's difficult to follow at runtime. They shift your focus away from flow of control to let you concentrate just on the way the objects are interconnected. And because this presentation will make extensive uh, discussion of interfaces, I feel I should introduce or reinforce the idea of an object-oriented programming interface. Um, these interfaces are found in many object-oriented languages, not just Java. You'll find them in C++, C Sharp, and their implementations might vary a little bit from uh, language to language, but uh, trust me, they're pretty similar. Um, so interfaces describe what classes that implement such an interface can do, or must be able to do, rather. They don't define how classes are to do these things. So you will tell the interface that you must have a method called getHealth that returns an integer, but you will not explain to the class that implements the interface that it, uh, how to do that. Um, and in Java, and I believe in C Sharp and C++, instances or interfaces can hold variables, and in Java, those variables by default are public, static, and final. And now we will discuss briefly interface versus abstract class, because at a glance, they kind of sound similar. Um, so we just discussed how interfaces don't and can't tell an object actually how to do the things. Uh, the methods, the business logic that they define, abstract classes do allow for the definition of shared but still overridable functionality of its subclasses. Um, and what I mean to say there is you can actually write method logic. If every subclass within your, that extends your abstract class implements a particular, I shouldn't say implement, that's an interface word, but has a shared functionality, like they all have one member that's called name, and it does it changes in the same way. You can have get name and set name in the abstract, and then you don't need to write them in the concrete implementations. So in many languages, at least the ones I'm familiar with, uh, they your classes can extend just one abstract class. However, you are able to implement numerous interfaces. So there's another reason why um, you might find one used in place of another. Uh, Interfaces are also more useful for connecting classes that are not as related as you might think initially. Um, let's think of there's a the interface clonable. Anything, any object can implement clonable. There's a reason to clone just about any object. And the objects that, let's say you have an object that's a cat and an object that's a set of computer settings. There's no relationship between the cat and the computer settings intuitively, but they can both be clonable by implementing the clonable interface. If you had the cat and the computer settings both extending the same abstract class, that I, I'm sure there's some way you can imagine it that it's possible, but it doesn't seem to make too much sense. With that out of the way, we can actually dive into some of these design patterns and start discussing them. So before I go into the code example for the builder, consider the circumstance when you have an object that may be instantiated with a number, we'll call that number n, different combinations of parameters. So if you have that many different relevant combinations, you would need n different constructors, where n again represents the number of combinations of parameters. And that can be very, very messy. Let's say your object has 50 members and there's 120 different combinations. Do you want to write 120 combinations of that in your constructor? 
do you want future code maintainers to have to update 120 different constructors? Probably not. Um, and a lot of the examples that you may have done in school at this point for object-oriented programming might not have a use case for more than one or two constructors, but uh, it's a very real scenario. You can run into that. And the builder pattern hopes to address this. So now we are going to shift our focus away from the presentation and go into here, the code. So I have distributed the code in Discord over in the uh, workshop channel. You can download that zip file, then open it up in your IDE and follow along. Um, for each package, there is a driver class. And um, yeah, you can run the driver and see exactly what I'm going to see when I run mine. So I have written the code for something that I'm going to call the simple builder package. And within that package, we have a class called enemy character. Um, this is just a generic, just an example. Everybody knows video games. Everyone understands the concept of an enemy. I can use words like health and mana, and you'll generally have an idea what I'm talking about. Uh, the builder pattern is far more, it, it extends well out of the realm of game design. It's very universally applicable to object-oriented programming, where appropriate, I shouldn't say universally applicable. But don't let the nature of this being tailored to a game example really have any influence on where you think this can be applied. Uh, so, uh, an enemy character has health, it has mana, it's got a name, it's got a move speed, it's got XP multiplier, and it's got a birthday. Or it may have. Let's say it may have. Um, so, I have prefixed all member variables with an M and an underscore, and this is, makes it easier to keep track of them, and I, um, throughout this, will put all parameter variables with a P, and an underscore. Uh, this is just an organizational thing and bears no actual influence on how the application functions, as you probably know. So we're going to dig deeper into this enemy character class here. Um, notice our constructor. It does not take a large number of parameters. Instead, it takes a simple enemy character builder. And we'll get into that in just a second. Then we've got a toString function. We'll see that later when we actually print stuff out. And now we're going to jump into that simple enemy character builder. So we mentioned the problem that we don't want to have a ton of different constructors. Let's say we want an enemy that just has a name, health, and mana. We don't want to have to provide move speed, an XP multiplier, and a birthday. So the builder pattern is going to address that problem for us. And I'm going to walk through kind of how this works, why it works, and then we'll go into the driver and see how it was implemented here. So in this static class, it's an inner class for our enemy character class, we are going to hold health, mana, name, move speed, XP multiplier, and birthday. These are all the fields we have up here. We're going to make a copy of them down in our static class. I shouldn't say we're copying them, but we're going to make another version of them down here. And then we have the constructor for the character builder. This is going to be all we need to have for this enemy character is a name. The bare minimum is a name, and we're going to put a name in the constructor. We're going to see this in just a moment uh, in the driver. If this gets a little confusing, it will make a lot of sense in just a second. Uh, we're going to set the health in our builder. We're going to set the mana. And notice here that every time with one of these functions, we return the object that is uh, being built. We're returning this each time. Uh, that's going to be really important later, and you might have actually seen this before in one context or another when we get to the driver. Uh, so similar to set health, set mana, we're just going to set move speed, set XP multiplier, set birthday. There's actually nothing fancy going on with these setters. They're just setting these class variables here. So. Um, then we have the build method, and this calls our enemy character constructor. This is what we pass to the enemy character constructor, and then that will extract all of these values, the one we just discussed down here, and assign them to the enemy character. And through this, we have achieved immutability. We, these values cannot really change anymore as the enemy character is... Um, uh, there's no setters. There's no setters at all. You can't actually change these values. You've got a nice immutable object. Great. So now we'll go into the driver and kind of see, let me close all these other files for now. 
we'll see how all of this interacts. Um, also, I should say, if at any point anyone has any questions whatsoever, uh, stop me and I will do my very best to answer them. Uh, <clears throat> but here we are. So we're in the builder. This is our builder driver. And we're going to instantiate an enemy character. And we're going to accomplish this by calling our simple character builder, or simple enemy character builder. We're going to give it that bare minimum of a name. And then we're going to call .set health dot set mana dot set xp multiplier dot build so this might be even easier if i show this when i start typing this dot it shows all the different properties or all the different methods we defined in our builder class and then we can set as many or as few of those as we'd like to and when we're done and we have our object all kind of planned out the way we want it we can click build and that will again call into our enemy character constructor well, when we call build, it will go boom into the enemy character constructor, and we'll have our object. So now another example of this, our enemy 2 just has a name. This is just Chompus McGee. He's got 10 health and a 0.01 XP multiplier. Notice there is no mana on Chompus McGee. Um, and then over here, we have uh, enemy number 3, also called basic enemy. That's kind of silly. We'll call it basic enemy 2. Um, oh, I also spelled enemy incorrectly. Twice. That's embarrassing. All right. Um, nonetheless, uh, this we can call all of these different functions. And now we can use any combination of these fields so long as we have a first name and we don't need to make numerous constructors for it. And that is a very good thing later on in... Um, actually, let me run. Sorry, I ran the wrong driver. But uh, that will be very good when you start dealing with classes, if you start dealing with classes that have a ton of data or a ton of fields, instance variables, however you want to call it. Um, so down here, this is our printout. We have basic enemy. The other fields just take on the default values. Um, Chompus McGee, even fewer values than basic enemy. And then basic enemy 2, this has everything. Calendar has a really lame two string. Um, I apologize for that, but uh, we can create all of these different objects using this builder object instead of different constructors. And then um, there is a way to take this even further and make it perhaps easier for maintainers, but I'd say generally harder to follow at the implementation level. I'm just going to pull up this page here that walks us through a step builder pattern. And I'm not going to go like really deeply into this. Uh, the link is there in the code if anyone wants to go take a closer look at this. And we're going to talk briefly um, about it. So this is what it looks like when it's used. Um, they call email.builder from email address of... So that's going to make an email address from that string to email address of that, yada, yada, yada. And it's doing kind of the same thing, but it's going to be a little different in how it's implemented. So uh, we have a bunch of interfaces that are the steps for the step builder. So the step builder ensures that certain steps are followed, like make a decision, this decision or that decision, then make this decision or that decision. Um, this code will kind of look. You've got the from step. That gives you the new builder object. Um, the from step then has a two, it, uh, it's got a two step, it returns a two step from the method of from. This can get really hard to follow, and that's why I didn't go into a code example of it. Um, but you can take the builder pattern further, and it can get as complex as you want it to, is the point of showing this example here. But the idea is that you must go through each of these steps before you can actually return the object. Uh, that's the idea behind the step builder pattern. Uh, so the next pattern to discuss is uh, another creational pattern. It's called the singleton. So we'll go over here. The singleton pattern uh, has one main job. It ensures that at most one instance of a given class exists. Uh, and it can be implemented eagerly in that it will jump into memory as soon as the class is loaded, 
or lazily, where it can go into memory at the time that it's first used. And there are drawbacks and benefits to each of those things, and we'll discuss those in a bit. Um, thread safety is really important with the singleton. I mean, thread safety in general is very important, but the singleton has some uh, considerations that must be made in particular. So now we can go into an example of the singleton pattern. Actually, quite a few examples of it. So the first one we'll talk about is the eager singleton. This is as simple as it gets. And remember, the goal is to make sure that at most, one of these classes exists in memory at any given time. So we're going to accomplish this. Uh, first off, notice the private constructor. So when we call this constructor, uh, we have to do so from within the eager singleton class. Um, now, the next thing to draw attention to is the static block. Uh, in Java, I don't know if there's an analog for this in C++ and C Sharp, but in Java, the first time a class makes its way into the class loader, this static block will fire. Once the class is loaded into class loader, static block will fire. And there's a cool detail about the static block, it is thread safe. The static block will only happen once. So this eager singleton, while it can be very wasteful with memory, is thread safe. Um, we're going to call the instance of eager singleton, just that instance, and we're going to make a method called get instance that will return it out. We'll see how this is used in just a moment. In case you're finding this to be harder to follow, I think the driver will make a lot of sense. Um, so then when uh, I put a count for this singleton, just so we can see how many times it's been instantiated, and we'll go into the driver here. I'm going to comment out the rest of this for right now so we can highlight what we just looked at. And here we go. So begin eager printing. We just tell it to print that. We're going to assign s to eager singleton dot get instance. And then we're going to assign s2 to eager singleton dot get instance. And now um, we're going to print some stuff out. So the number of times the constructor was called, again, that just goes back to our count variable over here. We're gonna print that. Uh, we're also going to print whether or not s and s2 refer to the same object using objects.equals. And then we're going to call the singletons do something method. So if we go down here and look at our output, we've got just one constructor call. We've got two objects here, but just one constructor call, that's good. And uh, they both refer to the same object, also good, that's the goal. If they referred to anything else, we failed to implement the singleton. And uh, we got the singleton's method. It printed out exactly what it's supposed to. So you might think that, well, I do not want to load this singleton eagerly. Why do I want it in memory? Let's say this class had something like a static method. Let's just say this class had like a static method called static int get money. No, that's a stupid name. Static and get year. Something like that. Return 2022. Right? So we don't necessarily want to instantiate the singleton when someone calls this get year function. Nobody's used anything that requires an instance of the singleton. But if we use this eager loading pattern, that is a consequence that we will end up suffering. So that introduces the idea of the lazy loading singleton. And the difference is that the lazy one will wait until it needs to be instantiated to make its way into memory. And by this logic, we are unable to use the static block. So we're going to go into the single thread lazy singleton and see how this one works. Uh, for the single threaded lazy singleton, notice we do not have the static block. When we call get instance, um, if instance is null, uh, we are going to return, or we're going to instantiate it just once using a private constructor. And then, no matter what, we're going to return it. So instance will only be null the very first time this is called because it's out of memory. And then we're going to return it afterwards. So no matter what, this cannot be externally instantiated, and it will be instantiated the first time it's called. So if you go into the driver, that's the wrong driver again. Singleton driver. So now we're going to comment out this. 
and we're going to uncomment. Oh, it's going to be a pain in the butt. Comment some more stuff out here. So here we go. Uh, we're going to run the driver for the single threaded lazy singleton. And the same stuff. They both refer to the same object. Exactly one constructor call, and we got the right printout. Then we can go into some thread safe singletons. The easiest idea for the safe singleton, you do exactly what you did for the lazy single threaded non thread safe one, but you put this synchronized keyword in front of it. Without synchronized, your program is not inherently thread safe. With synchronized, um, by nature, that code will be thread safe. I mean, you can probably break that with some hackery implementation, but synchronized code is thread safe. There's a problem with synchronized code, though. Synchronized code, while thread safe, is slow. It is relatively slow. There's a lot of overhead for it. And if you can avoid it, I would say you probably should. That's not to say you shouldn't use it ever, but there's a lot of time when you'd be best to avoid it if possible. So, same logic, if instance is null, i.e. this is the first time get instance has been called since this class made its way into the class loader, instance equals new single-threaded singleton, other than you return instance. Same exact thing as the other one, except the synchronized keyword. No difference other than synchronized. So, then you have a faster variation. This is another lazy-loaded singleton that is um, not using synchronized. You can call this the bill pew pattern if you'd like. Um, bill pew talked about this, I think it was pre-Java 5. But um, instead of using synchronized, you use a static inner class. And the static inner class by nature is thread safe upon its instantiation, similar to the static block from before. But the static class won't get loaded until get instance is called. That's the first time this inner class will actually make its way into the class loader. So by the same logic that allowed us to use the eager singleton thread safely, we're kind of extending it by adding this inner class and making this like a static block of its own. So this one is thread safe. And now we'll just go back to our driver. We can, I guess we'll just run everything together at this point, oh, whatever. And we'll see that all the singletons, there's just one, they all refer to the same object and they're printing what they are supposed to. So that is the idea behind the singleton pattern. Um, there's some singleton use case examples I'd like to discuss before we move on to one of the next two. Caching. Uh, when you're caching data, so you don't need to retrieve it again from the database or recalculate it for whatever reason you've decided to store some data, uh, we want to hit the same instance of a cache. Um, oftentimes, as I've seen it, caches are implemented as some type of dictionary or hash map, and we don't want to instantiate numerous instances of these caches because how, are, how is the user going to know they're getting the right cache? How do we know that the data we wanted to cache made its way into the cache we think it did? Well, the singleton makes sure of that. There's absolutely no way you hit a different instance of it because it is a singleton, and by nature, there can be only one instance. Uh, logging. Why do we need to instantiate a bunch of loggers? Uh, uh, the idea of logging, think system.out.println, but a lot more support for it. Uh, there's a lot of different logging levels and different, it's, it's fancy printing and file writing, really. So if you're going to have an object that takes care of this, oftentimes you can recycle the same object. You can have the main data logger, and then you can have another main database transaction OR map logger. But you don't need two database transaction OR map loggers because the one is adequate you can employ a singleton to make sure you don't waste memory spinning up numerous objects. And when you think of other people that may be programming onto your code, it also makes sure they know that they cannot instantiate numerous versions of this. And it's much harder to get around a private constructor than it is to overread a comment. 
You know, like, oh, I didn't see the comment that said don't instantiate more than one. Well, this actually enforces the idea that you can't instantiate more than one. Uh, so that's the singleton. And this is what happens when you try to instantiate something that has a private constructor outside of the class that uh, defines that constructor, you get an error. So it has a private access in the package slash class that it uh, is defined in, so we cannot call it. Notice when we call get instance, though, we can still get ourselves that instance of the thread that we're hoping to, or the, the singleton that we're hoping to. The next one we're going to talk about today is the adapter. Uh, so often described as a bridge, the adapter kind of allows two incompatible or previously incompatible interfaces to interact with one another. Uh, the code might make this a little easier, but you can think of it as a wrapper interface for a class so that it may conform to another one and it can be employed throughout many phases of the software development lifecycle. And we're going to get into that after we define the adapter pattern, or after we go into some examples. So I've written an example here called the simple adapter. I have decided to recycle the enemy character class. We also employ the builder pattern. I've actually just copy and pasted it into the package. Um, but uh, we're going to use enemy character. We're all familiar with it. It's got these properties. Not much more to discuss about the properties. However, in this example, enemy character, unlike before, will implement I attackable. So I attackable is an interface that, that defines that an entity, an object, can receive an attack. And receive attack is a void, and it accepts an integer that we're going to call P damage. So because enemy character implements I attackable, we have a method called receive attack. And what receive attack does is um, we subtract the damage that comes in from the attack from our health. If our health makes it to less than zero, we should set it to zero as there's, I, I don't know, I usually don't see negative health. You could have an overkill value. That would be the amount that your health is negative. However you want to do that, fine. I just thought just for contextual example's sake, we might as well put that in there. So um, the attackable interface does just that. So now let's say we also have the healable interface. And in this example, it would be completely wise to probably just also implement healable on enemy character. But let's say for some reason you might not have been able to do that. Um, what we can do is write an adapter for healable. Then we write, uh, so this adapter, it also just overrides heal. It doesn't look much different. But then this adapter has an impl, an implemented class. When you see impl at the end of the name of a class, it usually means the actual concrete implementation. That's where impl comes from. It's also kind of fun to say. Uh, so you've got um, an I attackable. That is uh, a class that implements the attackable interface. We're going to call that attackable entity. Um, and in our constructor, we simply take an attackable entity and set that to our attackable entity on the instance level. And now we have the method that's called heal that we're getting from iHealable. And what we do is we call receive attack on the attackable entity and we multiply the damage by negative one. And we've written an adapter to turn the attackable an enemy into a healable enemy using existing logic that is already completely present within the I attackable implementing class. So what this looks like in the driver form, I will show here, enemy character, do, 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 driver, here it is. So welcome to the adapter driver. Uh, we're going to define a simple enemy character. It's gonna be called our enemy. We're going to use the builder. It's called adapter enemy. It's got 420 health in honor of the occasion. And uh, we build to actually create an instance of it. And then we're going to print out before the enemy health, uh, before the attack, enemy health, receive attack for 40 damage. After the attack, we'll print our health, our healable enemy. Then we're going to make our adapter. We're going to wrap our enemy class in the adapter by calling it through the adapter, or putting it through the adapter's constructor. And then we're going to heal it for 50 health, and we're going to print out what we get there. So if this works, we have 430 health. 
So we started out with 420, we took 40, that puts us at 380, plus 50, we're at 430 health, and our healable adapter that allows an attackable object to be made a healable object is, um, it's implemented. It works. Here's a bit of a more involved example. It's a, again, similar to the other one. We're not going to go over it too much, but I will show it because it provides a bit more of a, it's more real world to me, right? Um, so this kind of defines how you can employ the adapter pattern to uh, uh, for media players. Let's say you have a media player that plays one type of file, and then the other one plays another type of file. And you want to make an adapter so that the player that doesn't play a particular type of file will now be able to. So I know that everyone loves UML, so we've got a UML diagram that will talk about all of the classes we're going to look at down in the bottom of this example. And don't beat yourself up over, oh wow, that's terrible. Um, don't beat yourself up over how bad this might look at a glance. I don't like the way this website is formatted. But briefly, there's a media player interface. It can play. It takes an audio type and a file name. There's the advanced media player that can play either VLC or MP4 files taking, again, file names. So VLC player implements that advanced media player, so it must override both play VLC and play MP4. So when the VLC player tries to play VLC, it will play it, or print out suggesting that it's playing it. When the MP4 method is called, it won't play it. When you ask the VLC player to play the MP4 file, it will simply do nothing. Uh, so then the MP4 player implementing advanced media player, exact opposite, but Analogous behavior, when asked to play a VLC file, it will do nothing. When it asks to play an MP MP4 file, it will try to convince you that it's doing just that by printing out that it's playing one. Uh, next, uh, they create an adapter interface that implements the media player interface. So again, our media player interface has something called play, and play needs an audio type and a file name. So what the media adapter does is it has an advanced media player, and in its constructor, it will take an audio type. The audio type is a string. If the type is VLC, the advanced music player will make a new VLC player. Otherwise, it will make a new MP4 player. So now, no matter what, when we call our media player, um, if we use this adapter, we will get the correct file out of it, the correct... Um, not the correct file, the correct class to handle playing the file. So now they actually implement it here um, in the concrete class that implements the media player interface. Uh, and as we can see, it checks the type and it will play it. Um, otherwise, it goes for the other type. Um, it will create the correct... Um, if, if we get the type... Okay. Um, we will use the media adapter to uh, play the file. So if it's not an MP3 file that we can play by default, we need to use our adapter to play the VLC or the MP4 file. So the basic one can play MP3 files, the advanced one can play the other types, is the idea. And then you can use the audio player to play different types using these interfaces and adapters that you just created. Um, again, the link for this is found right in the presentation. Don't break your back over it, but it's definitely worth looking at if you want a more tangible example than this kind of atomic enemy character business. <clears throat> so we talked about the adapter pattern being versatile and applicable throughout numerous parts of the software development lifecycle. So let's talk about how in at design time, if you're importing a library, that does things on classes that implement a particular interface that you would like some of your classes that you are designing or have already designed in the past um, to fit that, you can write an adapter so your code can fit the interface that's defined by the library you're using. Um, this can be very useful for all sorts of things, um, and it will generally require a lot less effort than rewriting everything you've already done to the point where you made this decision that you want to use that interface. Um, and kind of on similar grounds, but much later in the whole application development process, 
you can extend the life of your legacy code a lot by writing these adapters for more modern interfaces that are written as part of more modern systems. And that can save you many hours. It can save your company tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, great idea to use adapters in the right case if you want to squeeze a little more life out of some old code. Which brings us to another structural pattern, and the last of which we're going to dive into code examples. We've got one more to discuss after, uh, and then we might scroll through the book a little bit, but uh, it's going to be a briefer presentation tonight. So we're going to talk about the decorator. Um, the decorator can be used to change an object's functionality at design time or even at runtime. It's a very flexible pattern. Um, and I think a great time to use the decorator, and the internet would agree, when you want to extend the functionality of an instance of an object, but not all instances of the object. So if I want to make, at, at any given time, one of a particular class do something, and numerous variations of that can exist, or one object of a particular class type to do something, I can use the, the decorator pattern to do that instead of adding the logic that I'm trying to see for this on all the objects in the class, which could be dangerous. Uh, I worded that poorly. But let's say you have five student objects and you only want to decorate one of them. At any given time, you do not want to add decorate within student. You'd want to add the decorator pattern and then have it contain a student. And we'll see this in the code implementation in a, more, in, in a moment. Uh, so in its classic implementation, the one you'll find in the books and most of the literature I've come across, it allows for an object to be decorated repeatedly. And that can be really useful and really cool. So we'll dive right into that. <clears throat> so we're going into decorator. We've got the simple decorator. We'll start with our familiar friend, the enemy character. But this time, instead of implementing I attackable, we're going to implement I named entity. So we go into I named entity. It's a very, very simple interface. All an I named entity needs to do is provide a method called getName. That simple, it's really straightforward. So we go over to enemy character, we don't see a ton of errors, so we can assume, there it is, boom, get name. it exists. So then we're going to go into the enemy name decorator, which is an abstract class, and it implements I named entity. We hold a, an, an I named entity object called M enemy character. And our constructor will assign that value based on the enemy character that we pass in. Code example will make this clear. Uh, and then our getName function, because we implement I named entity, we must have a getName function. We're just going to return the enemy character's name. Great. So now here's where the actual kind of pattern will come full circle or make sense. It'll appear. We have the enemy title decorator. This is a concrete implementation of the enemy name decorator, and it will take a string title. It will take a boot. Well, when I say it will take, it has members of title, uh, space separate title, and prefix title. So, to explain what those do, the title is the actual title. When we say a titled entity, it would be like Dr., Mr., Mrs., uh, I don't know, Champion, King, Queen, Ruler, Monarch. Uh, whatever it may be. Uh, the space separate title would be to put that title before someone, or to put a space either before or after. So if you had like doctor period and you didn't want a space for whatever reason, this value would be false. Uh, similar, uh, the prefix title determines whether or not the title will come before or after the entity's name. Uh, so that just explains what this constructor is doing. And what it does. For its get name, and because we extend enemy name decorator, we, oh, this should probably override, or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, public string get name. If uh, it's a prefix title, we'll return the title. And then if it's space separated, we'll return a space. If not, we won't. And then the name. Otherwise, it is a suffix title, and we'll do the same thing, but putting it after the name instead. So in the driver, this looks like this. 
So we have an enemy character, we're going to call it C for simplicity's sake, Animaeus Magoo. He will have 100 health, and um, we'll build it. Great. So now we have an instance of enemy character called C. So now we have an enemy title decorator, we'll call it decorator, and we'll call it constructor. We've got C. We're going to uh, put the title doctor on it, and it's going to be a prefix title and a space separated title. Then, uh, for the sake of example, I said that decorators can be chained together and an object can be repeatedly redecorated. So we're now going to call second decorator, and instead of being on C, we're going to put the second decorator on the first decorator. And this title will be super, it will be a prefix title, and it will also be space separated. And again, for the sake of example, we've got the third decorator. Uh, we pass the second decorator, supreme. This is going to be a suffix title, and that prefix title is false, and it will also be a space-separated title. So now the, the meat of this, we're going to print everything out and see what it looks like. So the character name is Animaeus Magoo. After one decoration, we've got Dr. Animaeus Magoo, Super Dr. Animaeus Magoo, Super Dr. Animaeus Magoo Supreme for our last one. And... Um, if we were to add down here, s out uh, c dot get name, Animaeus Magoo, it's still the character has still re uh, retained its name, and it's only the decorator objects that have the updated name logic. So that kind of defines the or is a simple example for the decorator pattern. Uh, it's a very very flexible pattern. You can have it do a ton of different things. And it's particularly useful because you can make the decisions to employ it at runtime. Like, if one set of logic decorate the object, otherwise don't. And it, uh, it extends, the it implements the same interface, uh, that I named entity. So you can use it or not in any place that would use an I named entity. It can be decorated or it can be whatever existed outside of the decorator. And that is uh, the example I prepared for the decorator pattern. So, moving on, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the model view control, uh, controller design pattern. I think that this one is going to be potentially more important to necessarily grasp than the other ones, because MVC is so popular out in the software development ecosystem, especially with web development and web development is huge right now. So MVC works with GUI design and specifically the user interaction layer of it. Um, it's an architectural pattern that lays out a plan to separate logic into three distinct areas. You've got the model, it drives the screen, it can be retrieved and persisted to a database. The screen that the user sees and its various components, we call that the view. And then the controller will govern the interaction between the model, the view, and in many cases, the server. We're going to talk more about this. Hold on. Why MVC? It's organized. I mean, we just talked about the organization. Instead of writing all your code in one class or an arbitrary number of classes, you can organize it into three that perform distinct functions. Great. Um, it's maintainable. It, it is like a pattern. People understand MVC. It's tried and true. And if you um, use a framework for all of the MVC on a given project, or most of it, you can ensure that developers are programming things consistently. And there's like one language, and I don't just mean one like programming language, but one lang one style, one one voice that people are speaking with with these UI de uh, design decisions. And uh, it also facilitates uh, collaboration really well. It sucks to work on the same file with someone at the same time. But if you're working on separate files, version control with that is very straightforward. They do their file, you do your file. It's done. Instead of, okay, I do my file, I update, I commit, they pull, they solve conflicts, they commit, it, that can be a mess. But this kind of provides a way around that by separating logic out further. Um, there are some very popular MVC frameworks and implementations. I believe everyone's probably heard of Angular, JS. 
it's becoming a lot less popular now that React, React Native, and Flutter are taking off, but Angular was just about an industry standard for front ends for a while. Another popular JS is um, Ember. Uh, I've never used Ember nor Angular, so I can't speak authoritatively on those. Uh, you've got the Spring MVC. Uh, Spring is a massive Java library that has been around, geez, I want to say maybe like 18 years now. I, I don't know the actual number on that, but Spring has been around forever. It's got an MVC pattern. It's really, like Spring is really strong, another industry standard in the Java ecosystem. Um, for like quicker development, they have Spring Boot that kind of sits on top of the Spring API that allows you to just like pump out web applications like it's your job. Many people do pump out uh, web applications for their job using Spring Boot. Um, then we have ASP.NET MVC. That really should say MVC. I don't know how that one missed, but sure. And you've got Laravel and Symfony. Those are, uh, so ASP.NET, I, I, I was just, I was just, okay. Sorry. Um, ASP.NET MVC, that is .NET, so your C-sharp uh, MVC. We're going to talk more about that one in just a second. Laravel and Symfony are PHP MVC frameworks. Um, again, not a PHP developer. I can't really speak to those. Uh, oh, we're going to go back for a second. I think I can open that. Yes. Okay, so we're going to open this link. I found this to be a very interesting read. I can't actually cite the accuracy of it, but I believe it. I mean, I'm not surprised to hear that Microsoft uses ASP.NET MVC. Um, but uh, here are 10 websites written using that ASP.NET MVC library that I just talked about. Stack Overflow. I hope everyone's here uh, is familiar with Stack Overflow. If we're not familiar with Stack Overflow, let's just take a look. If you ever have any technology or programming related problem ever, I suggest checking Stack Overflow. You usually end up here from a Google search, especially when using natural language. But it's the best site ever if you're not familiar with it and you're a computer programmer, I suggest you get a acquainted. Um, Microsoft. Microsoft, pretty good website. You know, they've done well for themselves in the technology space. GoDaddy. Uh, GoDaddy was pretty big. I think Google's kind of overtaking them in the domain domain. But uh, yep, yeah, another website. Notorious, well-designed, efficient. Dell. Uh, everybody loved Dell. Old people probably still love Dell. Uh, they've got a nice website. Visual Studios website, Wild Tangent. Okay, I'm not going to praise Wild Tangent. Um, Ancestry, there's just big websites. Like this MVC pattern is real. And Taco Bell, Taco Bell is on MVC. And if the bell is on MVC, perhaps we should be too. Uh, we're going to dive in a little further to each of these components of MVC, so you might get a better idea of what they're usually doing or often doing. And I'll preface this by saying these implementations vary from framework to framework, from application to application, from use case to use case. Um, I have seen it where the, for example, the model is responsible for persisting itself to the database. Other times I've seen the controller call into a persister, which is just kind of, well, like a server-sided ordeal that handles the persistence to the database um, instead of having the model do it directly. Uh, but uh, the idea is the model is to think of the model as a data class. It can come from the database. It can go to the database. It might hold extraneous stuff to the database, but you're not putting things like validations within the model. You don't want to be checking the model's state within there because it kind of defeats the idea of the model, and then it becomes a business logic device too. Uh, you can generate data models using XML. Uh, there's a lot of uh, solutions to kind of reverse engineer an SQL database, if you would, and generate XML descriptions of the tables. And then you can use an XML parsing framework like JAXB in Java, or uh, I forget the name of the JavaScript one I'm thinking about. But then you can generate all these data model classes based on exactly what kind of data types are in your database. Instead of like if you have 100 tables, you don't want to go write 100 data classes. If all you want to do is represent the tables in Java, you can just make XML representations of the table and use a Java XML parsing class or C Sharp XML parsing class. You know, this isn't specific to Java to generate all of these classes for you. 
and you should probably program them to an interface if you're not generating them automatically. And even then, you can generate an interface automatically for them. Uh, we're going to now take a closer look at the view. The view has the fewest responsibilities in terms of like what it has to do. It holds all the screen components, and all it really needs to do is expose them to the controller. It says, hey, controller, do as you will. And what that accomplishes is the business logic and all of the actual like meat of what's going on is contained within the controller. When you have to update it, you update like what's going on. You just update the controller. You don't update the controller, then the model, then the view. And sometimes you may have to update all three of these if the application requirements change drastically. But the idea is for smaller updates, they're contained within one area of the application. Um, the controller should be updating the view. You don't want to have a complicated method to determine like, oh, if this box is empty, we're going to put a listener on that, and then if that event comes back, that doesn't belong in the view. That belongs in the controller. You should do that. I mean, the controller still directly interacts with events from the view. Um, but the, the view is really just exposing those com components to the controller so the controller can put whatever listeners it needs to on them. And uh, now we'll take a bit of a closer look at the controller. I've talked about it on the last two slides, so there's not as much to say, but it handles those interactions, again, between the model, the view, and often the server. Uh, it's responsible for listening to events. We just talked about that. And then it updates the model and um, view in response to those events. So, for example, um, let's say within our model, we track whether or not an object is deleted. And when I say deleted, I mean ready to be deleted from the database. And let's say that that is determined to happen when a user has a value in a checkbox that says delete after pressing OK or something. And when we click that checkbox, the view has exposed it to our controller. The controller has put a listener on it. And when it receives that event, the controller can flip the flag in the model. And then when the model goes to save itself from the database or ultimately delete itself from the database, uh, it will know based on the checkbox and the flag and all of this logic is right in the controller. The view and the model don't need any awareness of that interaction. They just exist and expose their data to the controller. Um, and to make this more extensible and flexible, you should program the controller not to a concrete implementation of either a view nor a model, rather to an interface. And if you do it that way, you can make a brand new view, just make sure it has the methods you needed from the, from the interface, and boom, plug and play. Ready to go because you've programmed to the interface level. Same with the model. If you end up using a more up, an updated model or a more complicated model, or you might be using a slightly different model of the same, if you do it at the interface level, it reduces the amount that you need to reprogram. And that's like the big takeaway, maintainability and efficient design. Uh, so these interfaces really help with that. Um, there is um, plenty of further reading to be done on this. I actually ran out of time in compiling the list of links, but uh, I will post those in the Discord later tonight um, with a link, list of further reading. Um, I very much recommend checking out the book here, Design Patterns, uh, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Programming. If you um, search Google for a PDF version of this book, there will be plenty of people that try to sell it to you, um, but you'll be interested in what you find searching for it. Uh, buy it from those people if you want to. Uh, here we are. Um, it's a book. It's nice. It uses really really good examples. They, they do a good job of explaining why you might do this. And there are, I think there's 20 patterns discussed in this book. We only really, really looked at examples of four of them. I'm going to look at the uh, different names of the patterns. Perhaps some of you have seen these before. The abstract factory, the builder. I hope you've seen that one at this point. The factory method, the prototype, the singleton. Again, hope you've seen that. We've got the adapter, the bridge, the composite pattern, the decorator, the facade, the flyweight, and the proxy.
Then for your behavioral patterns, unfortunately, we didn't really have the time to discuss those tonight, uh, but we've got um, a lot of other really useful patterns in here. Uh, I do not believe this book speaks of MVC, but I maintain that of any particular pattern I've talked about, MVC is probably the most useful or the most industry widely applicable. You're using it in, you, you've seen stuff that uses MVC and you will likely work on things that use MVC if you're outside of the space of research. Uh, so I would like to open up the floor for any questions. If there's any of these patterns that we didn't talk about that someone has heard of and wants to dive deeper into or any of the code examples I've presented are unclear or for some reason bad, I'd love to hear that and discuss it. All right, well, um, it seems there are no questions, so I would like to thank everyone who attended tonight for coming out and listening to this. I hope that um, it has inspired some thoughts about how to design software and perhaps has provided an entry point into learning about some of these ideas that have been come up before our time. Uh, I think that there is a lot to learn from this book or even from criticisms of this book. If you hate the idea of reading this book, you never want to do it yourself and you just look at why this book sucks or why other people think this book sucks, you will find some really interesting and insightful conversations. Um, the idea was not to have you leaving here implementing builders and singletons for everything. The idea is so when you encounter code that might be using a singleton or that when you're designing your own software, you think, huh, is there a design pattern? Has someone done something just like this before uh, that I can leverage, that I can make my design off of? Um, and this kind of differs from a framework where it's not like you're, you're not going to go out and download the singleton library. I mean, I'm sure there's something you can download that will be exactly what I'm talking about when I say the singleton library. But it's just a, a pattern that you, you follow when designing your application. So I hope that I've inspired some thought and perhaps that you've had some fun while listening to this. Uh, thank you once more. I'm very grateful that you all came. And I hope to return in the future with something even more interesting.